So I want to read a poem to you. The, the, the title of my message this morning is Instruments in the Master's Hand. And here's a poem. It's called The Old Violin. I actually heard it from Ray Oliver when I was in, in Europe recently. The Old Violin, The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bid, good people?' he cried. "'Who starts the bidding for me? "'One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two? Two dollars, who makes it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. "'But no!' From the room far back, a gray-headed man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What now am I bid for this old violin? As he held it aloft and its bow. One thousand? One thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who makes it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried. We just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with a life out of tune, or battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once, he is going twice, he is going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Isn't that beautiful, eh? That's a poem by Myra Brooks Welsh. And it speaks to all of us, and it's, it's, it's powerful because it talks to every one of us about our understanding of value. And for many, many people, we, we underestimate the value that we have in our lives. For, for many times, when we look at people, we value them based on maybe their accolades and, and what they've done and how much experience they have or how they can handle themselves. And, uh, but a lot of people have a, a low esteem and a low sense of value when it comes to themselves and to humanity in general. Some people, on the other hand, have a pride and an overestimation in value, but sometimes placing their value in things that actually are really secondhand or second priority. How sad to give your life to something, your whole life to something that you think is valuable, and then to find out that it wasn't worth it at all. And so we have a real need for the sense of true value, and there's really One touch from the master's hand, one moment in the presence of the master changes everything. Because even when it seems like there's people that have no value and those that maybe think too much of earthly comforts, there's a big difference when it comes to his purposes. I mean, the master touches a leper, the untouchable. And immediately, Jesus isn't made unclean. The leper is made completely clean. And you know, a touch must have meant something to that leper in a way that gripped his life forever. One touch meant a grip that couldn't let go. Because for the rest of that man's life, every time he looked at his baby smooth skin, he realized, I owe everything to the master who touched me. And so one touch from him can change everything for everyone. And thinking through the scriptures, I can think of a person who had both a, a significant impact on the world, at the same time, a totally misguided zeal. And one touch from the master's hand, and Paul's life is completely changed. And I want to look at his life, just a little bit of his conversion, actually, this morning. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to read the testimony of Paul. I want to highlight the testimony of Paul. Also the testimony of Ananias, who is integral in the story. And then I want to touch on some things like, what does it mean to be an instrument in the wrong hands? What does it mean to be an instrument in the master's hands? And then how can you and I make sure that we stay his chosen instruments for his purposes? Amen? Acts chapter 9, from verse 1 to 20. 
Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any man or woman who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled, he was nearing Damascus. A light from heaven suddenly flashed around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? Lord, said Saul, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to Straight Street, the street called Straight, whatever. (laughs) And the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and to ask for the man of Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many people talk about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, the kings and the Israelites, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went and entered the house, and he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time, Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Isn't that an incredible story? I'm so glad to read a Bible story to you this morning. (laughs) The beauty of the public reading of Scripture. The beauty of just hearing what God's saying to us through the Scriptures is amazing. But he has an instrument in the wrong hands. In a sense, you have... (laughs) I I asked the worship team if they had a violin because I I wanted to play uh, a song for you on the violin. And uh, Rudolph asked me, can you play the violin? I said, not at all. (laughs) Can you imagine if we had a violin here, and I attempted to play, and I've never touched or played a violin in my entire life, you would actually be screaming from the screeching that is coming from this thing, and ask me to stop, ears running out, so maybe demons would flee as well. But the reality is, here is someone who's playing the wrong tune. Yes, Saul is breathing threats. This is a man, you you, you come across this man initially with such passion and such zeal and such conviction, you would give him your vote. You would say, I I mean, if this guy was on the ballot paper, I would pick him because he seems to be very convinced about what he's saying and doing. He's breathing threats. He's breathing murder. He's a man of action, not just a man of emotion. He goes to the high priest. He makes an absolute effort. He's Mr. Action Man. He's going to go find the problems which are the Christian people and solve the problem by bringing them from Damascus all the way to Jerusalem and put them in prison. He's going to arrest them, capture them, and drag them kicking and screaming and lock them up as quick as he can. This man is, in a sense, on fire for the wrong thing altogether. Would you agree? I mean, he's, he's making such an effort, but he's deceived. He's religiously blind. He's kicking against the goads. This is what Jesus says about him when he, he mentions it in one of his other testimonies. The goads were these spikes that were uh, on the back of a, a chariot. And when the, when the horses were running and they started to kind of slow down, they, these spikes could spike into them so they kept going. And if you kicked against it, you hurt yourself. And so it kind of kept them going. And so Jesus is saying, why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you resisting what's coming at you? 
Because my kingdom's coming, my kingdom's gonna advance, and if you try to resist it, you're kicking against the goads. It's not gonna go well for you. And so he needs clarity, and he needs the king of the universe to come and bring the light that opens his eyes to see once again what it's all about. And so I love this word, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who was Saul persecuting? The church. And Jesus says, you're persecuting me. In other words, you touch my church, you touch me. Now we've heard those things, you mess with me, you mess with my family. Jesus saying, you're messing with my family, you mess with me. And Jesus takes it absolutely personally that any breath, any murderous thought, anything that is said that, that resists or arrests or challenges or tries to imprison the church of Jesus Christ is immediately messing with the one who's seated on the throne. Believer, disciple, church member in this place, know this, that if anything comes against you, it's coming against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he takes it very personally. And I love the fact when we read Psalm 18, it talks about a king and a God who will rip the heavens open and would come down on his chariot and would breathe almost fire out of his nostrils and respond to the ones that are calling out to his name. Because you call on his name, because you love him, he will protect you and he will guide you and he will be there for you. So don't let anyone touch you because they're touching him. It's just a sobering for us to realize that you and I, in our own lives, Shouldn't say what we say about the church. Shouldn't comment what we comment about the church. Shouldn't judge the way we judge about the church because we really are speaking about what touches him the most. And so our heart should be for him. He says, who are you, Lord? He doesn't know who it is, but he realizes this is a manier. <laughs> This is, sir, this is, I better not mess with sovereign, supreme authority, master, owner, absolute power. He's just knocked me off, his, off my donkey with light that's shining from him, and I can't see a thing. Who are you, Lord? Amen? And so, he knows he has to honor, and Jesus says, I, he says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You see, all Paul's teaching and all Paul's performance and all Paul's passion and all of it is playing a tune that is completely wrong. He's blind, he's self-assured, he's self-elevating, he's I'm Mr. Action Man, but all of a sudden he's groping in the dark and someone has to lead him into Damascus. <laughs> what a humiliating moment. And so, on the other hand, or let me say, in the master's other hand, is this Ananias. And Ananias, a disciple who we, we read of, of in this account, there's other Ananiases, there's Ananias the high priest and another Ananias in another portion of scripture but different people. But yes, just a disciple who we get to read of who has one instance where the Holy Spirit has put this man into the scriptures, a normal everyday believer who's living a life of pleasing God and doing what he does as a church member like every, any one of us, and God uses this man as an instrument in a powerful way, effectively, to turn the world upside down. And so you have this Ananias. He has a vision. One man is blind and another man sees. When called upon, replies immediately. One man says, who are you, Lord? Another man says, here am I, Lord. When the Lord calls, what is your response? One is told, get up and go, I'll tell you what to do. Another man is told, get up and go, and he tells him what he'll do. And so we have this amazing arrangement that Jesus is working, and the master with both his hands has taken one man and put him in place and said to the other man, I want you to go to this man, and I want you to minister to him, and I want you to lay hands on him. But Ananias is a little bit doubtful. Wouldn't you and I be a little bit doubtful? I mean, I don't want to name an enemy, but I mean, can you think of a serious enemy to the church of Jesus Christ? Uh, a dangerous enemy to the church of Jesus Christ. I, I can't think of a particular name. I mean, it's the devil in, in these people. But imagine God had to say to you one day in a vision, uh, I want you to go to that person and I want you to go and lay hands on them. I mean, your first response might be like Ananias's. Lord, don't you know who he is? <laughs> the Lord is 
don't you know who I am? You know, and so Ananias has heard all the news, and how many of us have been very interested in the news lately? And while people are saying things and there's news about a dangerous thing that's attacking the church and we better start something that can rise up maybe politically and challenge us so the church can be the church, or we can listen to the one who's got good news, who's above all the news, and he's got other news. And when he starts to speak, he's, I don't care what everybody else is saying. I'm telling you, Ananias, there's something that I'm going to do that is far greater than you can imagine. And so I love how Ananias his, his, these doubts, these fears. This Saul has got a bad reputation. He's, he's done an untold amount of harm. He's got authority and he's challenging people. He's arresting and putting people who call on the name into prison. He is enemy number one of the church in that day. But then Jesus says, he is my chosen instrument. Isn't that amazing? Let me ask you a question. How does God obliterate your enemies. I mean, some of us have got enemies. No, yes, perhaps. And have you ever prayed, Lord, take them out? And you read some of those Psalms where David says, smash that teeth out. And you've got a picture of your friend or your enemy and you're like, yes, Lord, smash those teeth out his face. <laughs> have you ever prayed like that? Anyone? No? Husband, wife? <laughs> <laughs> this is what Jesus does with our enemies. He saves them. He completely converts them. He completely changes them from the one that can do all harm, all imprisonments on my life, can, has authority to challenge me. Jesus takes them and turns them around and says, my chosen instrument. I mean, what incredible power does he have? And so pray for your enemies. That Jesus just save them. Turn them around. I hope they, if they're not already saved, maybe you're the enemy. <laughs> but Lord, turn them around. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let, let everything that they're about that is causing pain and harm and is imprisoning others, they actually imprison themselves. They need to be set free. And so Jesus does this in such an incredible way. Ananias' name means God graciously gives. And so he uses the disciple who graciously gives. I mean, anything that we've received has come from us, come to us because of the gracious hand of God. And he graciously uses us to graciously give a hand to our previous enemies. Isn't that amazing? May God use us. And so this is amazing that Jesus reveals himself to Saul. Jesus turns this man around for his glory and his purposes, but he still chooses to use an Ananias. Why didn't Jesus just reveal himself to Saul and, and, and teach him everything he needed to know immediately in one place and just everything that's required? Why, why did he make him blind? Why did he um, have him wait in a particular place? Because this is an incredible point for every single one of us. Jesus doesn't do anything without using his instruments. And so he could have done whatever he wanted to do with Saul, but he chose to use an Ananias who's written no books in the Bible, who's only mentioned in one occasion, to take an Ananias and to use him to lay hands on him. You see, because when Ananias lays his hands, Jesus is laying his hands. And when Ananias brings his hands to the blindness of Saul, Jesus brings the healing through Ananias' hands. And when Ananias lays his hands on Saul, Jesus' spirit is poured out and fills Saul. Isn't it an incredible thing? And in the other accounts, in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, when Paul is actually sharing his testimony, on one occasion, he says this in his testimony, he says, Jesus told me that I am to be an instrument for his name. But who told him? Ananias. In other words, Saul received everything that Ananias was doing for him as if Jesus was calling and doing it for him in that moment. And so not only is Jesus close to his church when we're persecuted, but he's close to his church when he wants authority and anointing to flow in this world. He wants to use those that have been graciously given a call, a purpose, an anointing, an authority. It's in every single one of us. 
and you don't know that the person that you have been led by the Spirit to go lay hands on and pray for, how do you know they're not the next apostle writing epistles for the nations to be saved? And so to be an instrument in the Father's hands, we sometimes would at the auction count ourselves worth one dollar, two, maybe three. But Jesus is saying to you, you, in my hands, the little thing that you do, the moment you come, the little you give, every time you pray, you continue in the small groups, every re time you're reading the scriptures, every time you submit to my ways, to my law, every little thing you're doing for me is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 more. It's valuable in his eyes. This is not a small thing we're a part of. There's no such thing as a small thing in the kingdom. I sat with Inna Marie and she said something which I put in inverted commas and made a quote from her. And she quite simply said this, Brad, don't pray easy prayers. Not just easy prayers. You know what's an easy prayer? Father, can I have a parking lot, a parking space on the way to the shops? Sometimes it's a hard prayer in Joburg. <laughs> but pray the kind of prayers, not in light of who you are, in light of who he is. And every prayer is valuable. And it doesn't matter how much you pray. And it doesn't matter whether you pray a little bit or a lot. The reality is it's powerful because of the one you're praying to. But if you understand who you're praying to, your prayers become not just prayers of thank you, Lord, for what we're about to receive. Make us truly grateful. And please, with one eye open, you look, bless the hands that made it because you want your mother-in-law or whatever to be blessed by the prayer. The reality is pray prayers of God. Turn this nation for your glory. Let the fire of God move from now spray to Cape Town and from the Southern Hemisphere all the way to the North and crack open Canada for your kingdom and let all those nations that have resisted you to this day, Lord, let them have Ananias's go into those places and see the kingdom of God break in, in a mighty way. How do you know that God won't use you? Don't undervalue what it means to be an instrument in the master's hands. And so immediately Saul begins proclaiming I mean, this is incredible. Ananias places hands on Saul. Ananias speaks to Saul, greets him as a brother. Ananias prophesies over his life. He lays hands on him. There's recovery of sight. There's healing that flows. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He baptizes him. He feeds him. He strengthens him. Oh, the work of disciples of the church of Jesus Christ. And then he has him join the disciples and vouches for him and his conversion. And so, immediately begins preaching, Jesus is the Son of God. What must we do to keep ourselves from being misguided, to stay His chosen instruments, and to stay in the Master's hands? For you and I, four things. Number one, the Lord of the Word. Why didn't you say, Brad, the Word of the Lord? You see, Saul has studied the Word of the Lord for so long. He's the top student. I mean, in, in Philippians 3 verse 5, he talks about himself. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding righteousness that is in the law, blameless. He had the word of the Lord. And he studied the word of the Lord from Genesis through the Torah, through all, the, all of those things. He studied the word of the Lord, but he never had the Lord of the word. There's a big difference between being religious and having all the, all the check boxes ticked and having everything right as far as the word of the Lord. But there's a major difference between having the word of the Lord and the Lord of the word. You see, the point of the scriptures is so that we know him so that we have Him, so that we walk with Him, so that our relationship is everything to do with Him. The gospel doesn't just save me, the gospel introduces me to the Savior. The gospel doesn't just deliver me, the gospel gives me the deliverer. It's not just something to have the Bible organized and studied from Genesis to Revelation, because if it's only the black and white on the pages and you can, you can be intellectual, you can have knowledge that puffs up. The, the thing that changes everything is when you know the one that is breathing through the pages, that is reaching out for your soul and that gets a grip of your life. It's got to be the Lord of the word. It's easy for us to get stuck into the work of the Lord, but forget the Lord of the work. 
You see, Paul had everything right, but as a result of that, everything wrong. His religiosity counted for nothing before Jesus. Imagine living a life, your whole life, where you are on the honors roll at the top of the pops and you've lived for nothing. It says that Paul had to have 14 years in Arabia dealing with these things in his heart. I, I, I can imagine the heart of Saul on that particular day on his donkey in Damascus. His heart for the church was this big. Kill them all. But by the time he writes these letters, 17 years later, he's got the biggest heart that anyone could possibly have. And he says, daily, I carry the burden of the children of God like a father. And every one of the churches is in my heart. What changes a man over that period of time can only be the Lord of the word. You see, the word can make you dry up. But the Lord in the word will help you grow up, strengthen you, help you, lead you. It's got to be a living relationship with him. Number two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the way that I place myself into the hand of the master, in a sense, is to have the hand of the master place itself in me. I love it when you think of the Holy Spirit and you think of his presence on the earth. Whenever you read about the Holy Spirit, yes, there are stories and, and, and scriptures of the Holy Spirit like a river flowing from the throne, but the reality is, from the be beginning of creation, the Spirit of God is hovering, and then the Word is spoken, and the Spirit is the agent creating everything. And in a sense, the Spirit is hovering, coming upon different people at different times, the judges, and coming upon David, and coming upon the prophets, and anointing them for a certain period, and for a certain task, and maybe lifting off them, the anointing lifting off them. But the, the Spirit of God hovering, 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 until the particular day where Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, and what is hovering now comes and rests on Him and remains. And then the Spirit in Jesus on Jesus. I tell you, Jesus loved the Holy Spirit so much. The Holy Spirit loved Jesus so much. There was this, this covenantal love between the two of them. They are united to each other in power. Jesus did what he did as a man, anointed with the Spirit of God. And when he stood up, after he'd been tempted by the devil for 40 days, comes out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he says, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And continues. And so now, in a sense, what was hovering has found a home. But then Jesus says, it's better that I go. Because when I go, the Father, I will sit with the Father on his throne. And from there, we will ensure that the Spirit is poured out, but lives inside of you. And if you're one with me, and I'm one with you, then what I have, you have. But the Holy Spirit then isn't just hovering, but is living inside of us. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He's not just on the outside, please come to me. He's on the inside, flow from me. And Jesus said, it's better that I go. I mean, it's an incredible thing. If I just think in terms of the word and the spirit, the Bible says this, the word is the sword of the spirit. In other words, the word is not using the spirit. The spirit is using the word. So the most important person on the planet today is the Holy Spirit inside the church. The most important person on the planet today for the end time call is the Spirit of God in our lives. And if we make it about the Word and we ignore the Spirit, then we haven't heard the Lord of the Word because he's highlighting to us, he wants us to have the gift the Father has promised since the days of Abraham. And he was longing to dwell inside of us since the days of Adam. But since the days of Jesus, he's made it possible. And since Pentecost, he's made it absolutely necessary that for the church to continue until the end, the Holy Spirit is the vital and most important person on the earth today. Can I get an amen? You see, because in the end, the, the first chapter of the Spirit is hovering. As Jesus dies and resurrected, the Spirit is put inside of us. And the last chapter of the Bible, the Spirit and the bride say, come. 
So he's with us from start to finish. And the whole intent of God was for him to be in us, to use us, to do what? Reach Israel? No. To reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Yes, Israel. But the Gentiles and the ends of the earth, including South Africans, 2,000 years later, even now Sprite. And even through you, instruments with the Lord's hand in you, he's gonna use you to go to the ends of the earth and to see his kingdom come in a mighty and wonderful way. The third thing is the touch of the church, and I've touched on it already. The touch of the church is the touch of the master. You see, Jesus has chosen to unite himself and work through and for his disciples, his church. When persecution comes to the church, it comes to Jesus. So to touch the church is to touch Jesus. But where can the world find the touch of Jesus? They find it in the hands of the church. You and I are the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth today. And so the touch of Ananias brings the healing of Jesus. The touch of Ananias brings the infilling of the spirit of Jesus. The touch of Ananias is the touch of the church. And the church is the instrument in the master's hands. It's not a small thing. Church Unlimited, I'm telling you this while no one else is listening. You are the most important church in the world. Anybody agree? One or two of you. Well, that's why you're here, because if there's another important church, you'll go there. Here's the reality. You will not give an answer for another church. You'll give an answer for this church. You will not give an answer to Jesus and what you did somewhere else. You're going to give an answer to Jesus for what you did right here, right now. So therefore, the most important church in the world for you is this one right here, right now. And quite frankly, if you think about the church as something unimportant, then you've missed it altogether. And if the church is important, well, then this church is very important and maybe perhaps the most important church in the world for you. But if you start speaking about it, you say, this is the most important church in the world. It's absolutely the most important church in the world because God's got the most important person inside of you doing the most important task with the most important message of the most important King of Kings to do the most important mission to take it to the places that need Jesus. You're the most important church in the world. And when you pray here, when you give your tithes and offerings here, when you submit to leadership here, when you serve, when you give of yourself, you're doing it for the most important church in the world. And guess what? We're a part of the universal church, and there's nothing more important than that. Amen. It's a great realization. Amen. It's an incredible thing to have that attitude inside your heart and your life. This is vital and important. And don't forget that you were saved, but don't forget there was a time when you weren't. And someone in the master's hand touched your life and Jesus turned yours around. Now, get in the master's hand and touch people's lives because the most important person with the most important message, with the most important healing wants to work through your hands. Look at your hands. These are the most important hands in the world if they are surrendered to Jesus' hands for him to touch whatever he wants to touch. He can't use someone else's, he's gonna use yours. Lastly, to carry his name to Gentiles and kings and Israelites. This is what Jesus made clear to Saul. To carry the name above all names. We sang about it this morning. You and I have been called to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear words from his mouth and to witness to all people. You and I have been appointed as servants. You and I have been called as witnesses of what we've seen and heard. You and I have been granted protection by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You have an apostolic ministry. Every one of you have been sent. May your eyes be open and may you open the eyes of those that are stuck in darkness 
And may you turn people from the power of Satan to God. Isn't that amazing? It says turn people from the power of Satan to God. Not turn them from the power of Satan to the power of God. Satan doesn't care about people and he uses his power to destroy them. God cares about people knowing him. So it's turn them not from the power of Satan to the power of God, but turn them from the power of Satan to God. To have him. And then you get his power as well. To receive forgiveness of sins and to sanctify people by faith in him. Let me tell you a quick story and I'll pray for you. I might have shared it at the equip here, but some of you might not have heard it. There was a, a lady in our church who's from Colombia. And she had a dream one night that myself and two of my other elders were preaching in the mountains of Colombia. And her nephew got saved from our preaching. And so she comes and she tells me this dream. I thought, well, that's nice. Let's just pray for your nephew. Lord Jesus, won't you save him? Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, God bless you. <laughs> she goes home, tells her husband about this, and they're still convinced that it's absolutely a word from the Lord. And they get four tickets a year for him, his wife, and two children to fly to Colombia. And uh, they decide, Brad, we want to give three of the tickets to you and two of your elders because we believe it's a word from the Lord. So I'll come with you and two other elders and we'll go to Colombia and we'll see what God has for us there. So I think, wow, he has vision and provision, but I'm not willing. So I phoned my friend, Bruce McAlpine, who's worked a lot since Colombia. I said, Bruce, won't you, um, when are you going to Colombia again? Do you want to, do you want to, do you want to take this car? <laughs> And uh, we can, you can go and pray for their nephew in the mountains. And uh, Bruce says, no, 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 Brad, Brad, Brad. He says, this, I'm going to a Holy Spirit conference. You've got to come with me. I thought, oh, no. Third confirmation, I can't escape. And so we plan this. We do some Zoom calls. This guy, David Varela, has a, a church that he was in before he was married. His wife was in a church before she was married, and they contact the church that they were in when they were married, and from the three churches, they get these conversations going, and it ends up with nine churches wanting to invite us in over 12 days. And so it started off with maybe some meeting in Colombia is now 12, uh, nine churches inviting us. And so we, we fly across and come to, firstly, this Holy Spirit conference. Bruce McAlpine can't make it. And there's a Guatemalan couple that are supposed to be ministering at this conference. Their plane doesn't fly. There's a Portuguese guy that's supposed to come across to this conference. He can't make it because the, the, the Catholic Church are withholding him in, in, uh, in Portugal. And so he's got troubles with his church and the Catholic Church. So he can't make it. So guess who's the Holy Spirit conference co uh, teacher? So now it's me and my, my other elder, and we start speaking on the Holy Spirit. And I had three sessions, and I said, the Holy Spirit shows us Jesus, the Holy Spirit builds the local church, and the Holy Spirit fulfills the mission. And those were my sermons. And God touched people. God set people free. There was deliverance happening. People were healed. God is doing amazing things. On one occasion, we have one day off, and uh, we go for a little tour around the city of Medellin, Medellin, however you want to say it. And... Uh, there's this tour guide, and, and I say to the tour guide, do you know Jesus? He says, oh, no, 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 I worship the Jaguar. I thought, the Jaguar? Did the Jaguar die for you? And so uh, that's what I said to him. And he, 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 he thought I was joking, and we carry on, and we, we're ministering. And we eventually get to this, the first Catholic church. I don't, have a, I don't have a big problem with Catholics. I have a problem with their doctrines, but I love Catholic people. I just want to say that. There's this Catholic church, and I walk in there, and, and I'm a little bit irked by it because there's just worship of babies and worship of ladies with babies, and I was like, oh, Lord, help us. And we, we, I walk in, I see this guy is confessing his sins to a priest, and the priest is lying like this on the other side. He can't even see. I'm like, hey, the guy's sleeping. But anyway, and um, so I'm very irritated, and we get to outside, and there's a, there's a beggar at the door, messy, dirty, horrible man. He's begging and he's, he's putting out his hands. And, and in my heart, I confess, I judged him and I said, mm -mm, I know why you like it. It's because you're begging, yeah. And I walk off. And my friend Ian says to me, Brad, we've got to go pray for him. And I thought, oh, okay, Ian, go ahead. You pray for him. <laughs> so we go over there with my friend David and the, and the tour guide. And he prays and, and with the translator leads this man in a sinner's prayer. 
And this beggar stands up and he looks up to the sky and he puts his hands like this and he starts saying in, in um, Colombian, he starts saying, abundance, abundance, abundance. What makes a beggar asking for money at the foot of an old Catholic church have to then stand up and say, abundance, abundance, abundance. That's Jesus Christ sets him free, saves you. My heart is immediately judged. I was reluctant, but look what the Lord did. And so we carry on to the point where, where the um, tour guide is going to see us off. He buys tickets for us to get onto the train. We're about to get onto the train, and, and there's like this gate, and we've gone through the gate. And then he says, wait, wait, won't you pray for me? The Jaguar man. So I'm like, yeah, come on, let's pray for you now. I'm like, ah, pray for anyone, you know. <laughs> pray for the guy. He gives his heart to Jesus. He's weeping, and we're like, the train's going bye-bye. He's walked off crying. Jesus inside his heart, and we get on the train. Thank you, Jesus, for doing another amazing miracle. But here's the best one. On the last day at the last church, the nephew comes to pick us up, and he's driving us up the mountains of Columbia. And we get up to the top there, and he's playing ACDC's Highway to Hell in the car. So I said, Highway to Hell, we're going to church, eh? Like, Highway to Hell. Anyway, we, we get, to the, get to the church, and I'm preaching about the glory of Jesus. And I say, every single person in this place was on a highway to hell, except when Jesus saves you, sets you free. And this guy's sitting there with eyes wide open, and he gives his heart to Jesus. And it's live online. And Adriana is watching in South Africa as her nephew gives her heart to the Lord in the mountains of Colombia. 